Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the weekly meeting. Today we have a special guest, Chase Ross. He's over here in Hawaii with me. You can see him by his Aloha shirt. Um, but I'm just going to wait a few more seconds, let everybody trickle in, and then uh, we'll be kicking it off. So Chase is uh, he's a mortgage broker out here in Hawaii, but he's actually multi he's licensed in multiple states, and he'll he'll share those states that he's in. But uh, he's going to just be giving us a little spiel on on his experience um, in the military because he's also a veteran, and then also getting into real estate investing, and then the bulk of his his talk will be about what's the difference between a mortgage broker and just other lenders, and why it's better to work with brokers. And he'll answer the question: Are brokers really better? Well, All righty, <laughs> everybody's just about here, so I'm going to go ahead and. Take it over to Chase. Chase. Uh, aloha, guys. I'm Chase Ross. I'm with Edge Home Finance. And as Zor said, that's a, a mortgage brokerage here. Uh, it's, it's nationwide growing to almost every state. We still have a, about a handful of states left to uh, secure, uh, but we're, we're very grow, uh, a big industry, um, the, a, a brokerage and uh, growing still. But um, a little bit about me um, from Michigan. Uh, after college, I joined the Marine Corps. Uh, and then did uh, my one and only tour out here in Hawaii. Um, after a couple of years, realized that the Marine Corps wasn't going to be a career for me. Um, I enjoyed it. It was comfortable. But I realized that the best thing for me in my future was to kind of rip that comfort bandaid off and, and just get out. And so real estate was really that avenue for me. Um, in college, I got uh, interested in real estate investing. Uh, if I came across the uh, Purple Bible, as they call it, um, which is the Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard about that book. Um, and that led me to real estate as a, as a good investing platform. And then I found uh, Bigger Pockets. Bigger Pockets is a huge, um, free, largely free um, real estate forum and networking. Uh, they have a bunch of uh, podcasts and stuff. So that's really how I got the passion for real estate investing. Um, and ended up buying my first property at the end of my senior year um, in Michigan, where I'm from. Um, and since that time, I, I've acquired properties uh, on the side, bought my home here in Hawaii, um, and also a limited partner on some syndications, some larger unit syndications. Um, so in total, I'll have eight units to myself. And then, I'm, uh, like I said, limited partner on a syndication in Virginia for 12 units. So uh, I've been in the space now for about five years. Um, and now kind of building up my own syndication on the side, aside from being a broker. Uh, so still very in tune with the real estate investing. So that was kind of concurrently with my Marine Corps career. And as I discussed and how I was uh, kind of came into the conclusion that the Marine Corps wasn't going to be a career for me, I started thinking about options. You know, uh, there's the typical uh, officer route of going, get your MBA and then go work in the corporate sector. And that didn't really appeal to me. Um, I, I knew that my long-term goals was to be in real estate investing kind of full-time, uh, syndicating and, and things like that, uh, rehabs. Um, but I knew that jumping from the military straight into a full-time investor probably wasn't a move for me. My portfolio couldn't sustain my, uh, my life uh, as it was currently um, and still needed time to grow. So I definitely needed that career to bridge the gap in between um, W-2 pay in the Marine Corps to full-time real estate investor. And I thought, uh, what better, what better uh, opportunity or, or side avenue than another tangential career in the uh, real estate industry and being hands-on in the real estate industry. And that's when I came across um, potentially being a realtor and or a loan officer. Uh, I met a, I bought my house out here with my VA loan here in Hawaii when I got stationed out here. And I, I stayed in close contact with the lender who uh, lent on my house and we became friends. And when he knew I was uh, debating whether to stay in or not, he kind of planted that seed of why don't you come right. be a loan officer with me? Um, so that, that's what really kind of set my mind. And I decided, hey, I'm going to go all in uh, and I'll be, I'll do the, the loan officer side. So that's kind of where I am now. Uh, I did the Marine Corps Skillbridge program um, with uh, that, that buddy that I was talking about as a loan officer. And kind of transition into this brokers versus loan officers, we actually began, I began as a retail loan officer. So for those of you that don't know, loan officer is pretty much the generic term of uh, a loan originator, a mortgage loan originator, MLO, uh, commonly known as LO, loan officer. Um, but then it, then it snakes into two, two categories. You got 
your mortgage brokers, which is the wholesale channel. And then you have your retail loan officers, which is the retail slash correspondent channel. And when you think retail, you're thinking brick, your brick and mortar places, you're thinking your loan depots, your, your banks, your USAAs, something uh, that has an office space and, and those loan officers are selling what's on that shelf that, that they can only sell that institution, that lending institution, that repositories products. Whereas a mortgage broker on the other side, the wholesale channel, they can shop the entire market um, who would, whatever lending institution or whatever repository uh, institution is selling uh, mortgages. If they have a wholesale channel open uh, that, that, that is open to brokers and that we can, that's where we get the name broker, the, the loan between the loan, uh, the lender and the consumer. And so it, it's like cost, I mean, Costco is wholesale. So it's cheaper to go buy at wholesale, just like it is cheaper for the consumer to go buy a loan using a mortgage broker. And the reason this is uh, why it is better for consumers to go to the broker channel is just is uh, flat out. There's I'll highlight several reasons, but the first is, is price. Um, with the retail space, you have a, a lot of overhead. You have those brick and mortar offices. Somebody's got to pay to keep the lights on. Somebody's got to pay for the, the front desk reception, the, the secretaries, the marketing team. And who ends up paying that? that that's the consumer. So all those bells and whistles may seem nice, but I'm sure when you ask a consumer, would they rather have a, a nice marketing team that's marketing, not even on the behalf of the consumer, maybe they get a little snapshot of their signing, or would they have X amount, a thousand extra dollars in closing costs in their, saved in their pocket? What would they rather take? And I'm sure uh, the majority of consumers are going to pick the latter. So when we began in uh, the retail space, I kind of knew this inherently because through my own investing experience, I understood the difference between a broker and retail. And whenever I went to go get a loan for one of my investment properties, I was always going to a broker because I knew that I would get the best price and the lowest cost. And so when I started SkillBridge um, with, with my mentor, as I spoke before, they were recently going to transition from one retail branch to the next, and they were becoming Loan Depot. And on, to be honest, when I wasn't really stoked about it. Uh, it, it. Something didn't sit well with me. And I knew what it was after is the fact that I didn't really believe in what I would be selling because I knew that how can I go reach out to veterans or non-veterans and try to sell them this product that me, myself, when, when I go to get a loan, I wouldn't use, I would use a broker. And we kind of all had that inherently in the back of our head, like, yeah, brokers are better, but we would, you know, we would eat the propaganda. Our branch manager would tell us, oh, but well, we got this sweet office. You know, they can come in and sign. It'll be awesome. They get the lights and the bells, and the whistles. This really matters to the consumer. Don't worry about the higher price. And so, we kind of ignored that for, for a bit. Uh, my, my mentor was in the retail space for about six years. And then luckily for me, and I feel blessed about this. I mean, about a month after I joined the skill bridge, he, you know, he decided enough was enough that he was going to transfer over to the broker side. And he fortunately took me along with him. Um, and that was late la at the end of last year, 2022. So we've been in the broker space and I can, I can tell you all the, the propaganda that my branch manager tried to throw at me to stop me from switching over to the broker side is completely unfounded. So I want to take some time just to kind of talk about those differences. We hammered on price. Um, there's no way a retail loan officer can beat a broker in price. Um, not only are our rate sheets just priced better off the bat, um, retail loan officers can also, you know, waive additional fees and whatever to be competitive and kind of like uh, be competitive on that loan. However, uh, they need to go to their branch manager to make that decision. Uh, they they work in a in a branch and they their branch manager has that authority. Whereas uh, independent mortgage brokers such as myself, such as anybody at Edge Home Finance or any of the major mortgage brokers, they are independent. Yes, we have a brokerage overhead, but we are making the decisions for ourselves. So if we need to be competitive on a deal, we can waive whatever we need to waive, and that's a, a decision that we make, not that our branch manager makes. So although you could potentially be in a uh, competitive deal if, if a retail branch is on board to compete. Over time, they're not going to be able to compete and waive those fees time after time because they have that overhead that we spoke about. They got to they got to pay the lights there, uh, the utility bills. They got to pay salaries. So just in the long run, there's just no way uh, that they can compete. And something that was interesting to me that I recently found out uh, 
brokers, mortgage brokers now make about 30% of market share of loan officers. So we said, you know, there's two types of loan officers, retail and brokers. Of all the loan officers, about 30% are brokers now, and it's growing. And I, we saw that. I saw that. I was like, oh, wow, brokers are becoming the new thing. And I was completely unfounded. Brokers were always the thing. Before 2008, almost 90% of loan officers were brokers. Um, obviously, with the 08 crisis and Dodd-Frank and all the legislation that came down, that kind of got axed. And that, that's where retail kind of took over from 20, uh, 2010 to about 2022. Uh, and still to this day, they, they have a large market share. However, brokers are taking it back. Um, one thing that uh, retail will say is brokers don't have any control. Um, they don't have the, all their staff is not in-house. They contract it out. Um, I actually take that and, and I say, because of those reasons, we do have more control. In my experience in retail, we have in, in, lo in uh, lending, we have loan processors. So the, the loan officer is the kind of the front end customer facing, whereas your processor, your loan processor is the back end doing admin uh, initial underwrites uh, and, and moving that loan after uh, a contract is received. Uh, retail branches have those people in house. And that sounds great uh, until they get swamped and you have to kind of compete with your coworkers for this process to, to work on your loan file before uh, they work on uh, your colleagues uh, profile. And so we've had multiple times in, in the retail space, where we had to like beg our processors to work on our loan files uh, and, and get this through so we could close on time. In the, in the broker space, that's not gonna happen because we contract out these processors. We are paying them per file. And so if they don't do a good job or if they don't give us the service, uh, that we expect, or they don't give our borrower the service they expect. What do we do? We just go to the next contract processor. We fire them and get the next one, and it's 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 an easy process and it's quick. So that decentralization is actually kind of our our strength. Uh, is that we we aren't tied to the that retail office space um, in in the confines of who works there. We're not we're not dictated by those those employees. We can constantly shop for the best for our borrower. Um, and then of course speed. Um, one of the biggest mark, uh, players in the wholesale um, space right now is United Wholesale Mortgage. They're taking over a large market share of, of the mortgage industry. Um, they're based in Pontiac, Michigan. Uh, Matt Ishbia is the CEO and president. He also owns the Phoenix Suns. Um, so he's really passionate about this, that brokers are better. Uh, his his uh, um, wholesale mortgage, United Wholesale Mortgage, they don't have retail loan officers. Uh, they only broker out. They only have a wholesale channel. So they are super big on brokers where their main competitor, Rocket Mortgage, I'm sure you guys heard of them. They do have wholesale channels. So some brokers can broker uh, Rocket Mortgage uh, loans. However, Rocket Mortgage has retail loan officers that are attached to them. And those loan retail loan officers, of course, would only sell Rocket mortgage uh, loans. So you can kind of see with Matt Ishbia and UWM, he is all in on brokers that he is not even having his own retail loan officers. He knows that his pricing is so competitive uh, in, in this environment that he doesn't need to have uh, his own dedicated retail loan officers. He knows that brokers will choose his product. Um, and that's just one of the many lenders that we have. Like I said, they're, they're the major player in the space. Uh, and are quickly taking over the industry. However, they're not great for everything. Uh, they're not great for manual underwrites when we have poor credit. And that's where, we, as a broker, we have those options. So I can't speak to other brokerages, but Edge Home Finance has a hundred plus lenders, meaning we have a hundred UWMs that we can go search for. So when we are pricing on a loan, we, are, we have a software that kind of uh, sits through all the loans available to us through all the different lenders. And, it, and we can use that software to price out the best loan for that client based on their scenario. So like I said, if I have somebody with low credit, I'm probably not taking them to UWM because UWM is great for your cookie cutter, decent credit, good income. But if they are uh, struggling on credit, lower income, I might take them to PennyMac. I might take them to Orion Lending. And we have all these tools available to us that uh, the retail space doesn't. They only have what they... The, uh, the institution that they work for. And if that institution is great at VA loans, but aren't good at FHA loans, well, then you're bum out of luck when you send them a, a client that's doing an FHA loan or somebody who doesn't have great credit. Um, so that's just the flexibility uh, that um, brokers can provide. Um, so all those tools that we have. And then um, we talked about 
price. Um, I just talked about control and then speed is just unmatched. And I, I kind of preface that with UWM because they are leading the space. It's very common that we submit a loan to their underwriting department and get one day approvals. Um, on my Instagram handle and all my teams here in Hawaii's Instagram handles, we're constantly putting that in our stories. Congratulations, one day approval. Uh, and then it's uh, very common for uh, UWM and, and some of the other competitive wholesale channels to be clear to close in, in 14 days, which is just mind blowing to the retail space. I can't tell you how many times we have taken loans from Loan Depot or Veterans United or Align Mortgage uh, and, and the, the, the real estate agent that brings us to say, hey, they couldn't do the loan, they, they, their underwriting requirements are too strict. And, and it's not even an issue for us. And we're clear to close in uh, 14 days. And it's kind of comical because those loan officers are like, what kind of magic, what kind of uh, debauchery or like illegal things are they doing? And it's just not illegal at all. It's just, we have those, those lenders that are able to lend on such lower rates or co more complicated situations that, they, that, that those retail offices are just don't have access to. Um, so it's, I could just go on and on for why brokers are better, but just the main takeaways is price uh, unmatched speed um, the, the the ability for us to close a loan quick within 30 days under 30 days often oftentimes is just unmatched um, in the retail space you're just not going to get that that streamline in, in uh, this way it goes and then control um, with the fact that we are decentralized and we get to choose who we work with uh, that actually gives us more control over our files. Um, and we don't have to wait on bureaucratic red tape or uh, slow processes. Um, so those are the main reasons why brokers are better. Um, I, I don't know how long you guys have talked about kind of the loan officer realtor relationship, but I'm sure you guys are aware that it's a symbiotic relationship. We depend on each other to do business in this industry. Um, I've had great experiences with realtors um, so far. Um, and like I said, there's no, there's no way we can do this business without it. And it's a team effort and it, it's really cool to form those uh, relationships with real estate agents, help them grow. They help you grow um, and, and you help each other. Um, one of the major things, I guess, key takeaways for me at this point that I could give realtors and, and there is conflicting um, opinions on this, but when you work with a, a borrower um, that is not pre-approved, you, you are assuming some risk. Now, I there's some school of thoughts that do not work with the borrower until they're pre-approved. And there's another school of thought that, hey, times are tough. Uh, work with whoever you can, and hopefully you'll get them pre-approved um, when you can and, and take them around shopping in the meantime. I just want you to be aware of the risk with that. I just had a client, uh, a realtor I met, um, uh, we, we met at an open house. I met his borrower as well. And we got in contact and I, I sent, I talked to the borrower on the phone, uh, sent him my application link and said, Hey, you know, as you know, uh, cause he's bought homes before getting pre-approved is really step zero in the home buying process, uh, followed by step one, working with your realtor to start shopping. Um, but what's the point of shopping unless you know what you can afford? Uh, we don't want to be shopping in the dark. So he understood that. Uh, he was very slow to fill out the application. Um, I don't know if he was just busy or kind of like a, a trust thing with some documents. I, I get that with some borrowers. Um, however, some days have gone by and, and the realtor was antsy to take him shopping and they were looking at prices and asking for payment estimates, a uh, service that I'm happy to provide. Um, but I would, I would let them know that, hey man, uh, I haven't pre-approved this client yet. So these, these numbers, this price estimate I'm giving you is completely hypothetical based on good credit, decent DTI, uh, things of that nature. Like I haven't looked at his file and he's like, yeah, I know he just really, I, he makes good money. He told me he makes good money and this, this will work. Just he'll, he'll get the loan application, uh, soon. And I was like, all right, man. So I'd send him these payment estimates, come to find out like two weeks later after this realtor showing him homes in here in Hawaii in the 1.4 region, 1.5 million, he wanted a single family home. Uh, come to find out when I finally was able to uh, pre-approve this guy because he completed his application, the guy only, you know, afford, can afford 950. Now that's, that's a lot still, I understand, but that's still $500,000, just about less than what we were shopping for. So you could make an argument that that realtor, when he was showing all these houses at that 1.5 price point was kind of wasting his time. Now you could argue maybe he was building rapport with that client. 
and, and getting to know him more, but it's just to kind of point out that you should really try to push your, your clients to get pre-approved first fully uh, before taking them shopping, just so you have an idea. So, you know, for sure uh, what they can shop for. And I, I guess that in, in so far, that's like kind of the biggest shortfall. And the thing that I always like to tell my, my realtor partners up front is, Hey man, or girl, try to please get them uh, pre-approved first. Cause then we don't have to play these guessing games or, or these trust games that he's telling me he makes as much as he does. And we can just know for sure after I pre-approve them and you can show them houses in that price range. Um, that would be my major takeaway um, with uh, the realtor loan officer relationships. Um, I've been blessed with working with some great realtors like SOAR um, that make the job fun and enjoyable. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, at this point, Zor, uh, am I missing anything? Anything you want me to cover? Any, uh, anything to add? No, you covered everything. I really appreciate that. And that's, that's definitely a valuable learning lesson. Um, you know, everyone in here, yeah, you, just stepping into the real estate business, you're you're excited just to work with anybody. You don't you're, you almost don't care if they're uh, pre qualified, but uh, yeah, it's definitely a valuable learning lesson because you know you start shopping around with them. They they get their expectations and their hopes up. They're like, oh yes, I can I can afford a five bedroom house with a swimming pool. Like yeah, like it's it's all gonna work out. And they have all these dreams in their mind, and then they go get pre approved. They finally take that step zero. And they realize, no, I can't afford this five bedroom house with a pool. It's actually going to be a two bedroom condo and it's only going to be a thousand square feet or less. And then they're like, well, screw it. I'm just going to rent because that's because renting is cheaper. And then you're like, well, I'm glad I just spent the past three weeks shopping with this person, burning gas and energy that you could have spent, you know, marketing, getting an actual qualified client. Um, and so that's, that's definitely some, some valuable advice right there to keep in mind, especially as a, a new realtor. Um, but thank you for all that, Chase. Uh, we'll, we'll open yeah. it up for some question and answer if you have a, a few minutes. Yeah, absolutely. I actually just saw a question come through so on screen. Um, how do we find a mortgage broker? Um, so we make it, mortgage brokers make it very easy to find, uh, to find ourselves and we're, we, we're not quiet or silent about being mortgage brokers. So, um, Obviously, get, uh, huge uh, hints or uh, giveaways that they're not a mortgage broker is if it's a main retail, if it's a bank, any bank or credit union, they're not a broker. Uh, if it's a if it's a major box office name, uh, Rocket or uh, Celebrity Home Loans or Loan Depot, those and they don't have mortgage broker to the name, chances are they're not a mortgage broker. And you can check out. There's some more uh, more local branches because you still have local small retail. Just because somebody's small does not mean they're a broker. That just means they're a smaller retail branch. Um, a biggest takeaway is if you go to their website, if you don't see anything about a mortgage broker on their homepage, they're not a mortgage broker because a mortgage broker, a mortgage brokerage will let you know immediately that we're mortgage brokers because that's something that we take pride in. So if you go to edgehomefinance.com, you're going to see top rated mortgage broker 2022 by the AIME association, things like that. Um, but a simple way to find one in your area, if, if that's something you want to do is just mortgage broker, you know, Google search mortgage brokers in my area. Now I will say uh, on the lending side of the house, we are a lot less geographically constrained as I would say realtors are. Uh, for instance, I am licensed in California, Hawaii, Michigan, Florida, Virginia, and Texas. And I, and I frequently do loans in those states. Um, and that's because I'm not the one showing them the property, right? I'm just doing the financing side. And even with the time change uh, we've found, because I have a, a group of uh, veteran loan officers here uh, that also do loans on the mainland. And, and the, the time difference is not an issue, especially when we're talking about these, these quick timelines and that we're already ahead of the curve, like it, it's not an issue. So just in that mind, with taking that in mind, you don't need to work with a mortgage broker that's in your local community. Um, but however, if, if that's something that you're more comfortable with, you want to meet people face to face, then yeah, just do a quick Google search in your area, uh, mortgage broker, and make sure they have some kind of mortgage broker in their title, in their title, and not just loan officer. I dropped Chase's contact information in the chat box. Uh, what states are you, are you licensed in, Chase? Uh, I got Florida, uh, California, uh, Virginia, Michigan and Tennessee and Hawaii right now. And, and, and more, to, more to come as well. Um, we found that 
if if we have a loan in a state, it's usually cost effective to get that license. And uh, on the lending side, uh, it's very easy to get a license in another state as long as you're already a licensed uh, mortgage loan originator. Uh, they have what's called temporary authority, uh, which allows you to originate loans in a loan in, in a state immediately. And then you can do the admin on the back end and that doesn't affect the consumer. So really, uh, if the juice were to squeeze, typically you get licensed anywhere. Awesome. Thank you. So, so all you Florida and California folk, I know there's a lot of those in here. Definitely take his information down. Uh, looks like we have a question from Josh Davis. Yeah, so I'm in the middle of doing a purchase myself and working with a mortgage broker. Nice. And they ran my credit report, get my credit approval, and now I'm getting bombarded with phone calls from all the rest of these brokerages trying to use my business. Is there yep. any way that the mortgage broker could have done something different in order to make sure that I'm not getting a phone call quite literally every 10 minutes? Yeah, so there is. And so what is happening is these people, uh, these other loan officers, brokers are getting your data from the, the credit bureaus when he does a hard pull of your credit. Um, and so the way that we help mitigate people do this is before we pull their credit, uh, we send them an opt out um, email and it allows them to opt out with the, the credit bureau so that they will not share that information. And we do that before we pull their credit hard so that they won't get those spam calls. Not everybody gets the spam calls. It's kind of like hit or miss, but we always direct our clients to fill this opt out out so they don't get spammed uh, as soon as we pull their credit. And one thing that a lot of brokers, I can't speak for every brokerage, but um, a lot of brokers, Edge Home Finance, we have uh, the ability to do a soft pull. So typically, depending on their timeline, we'll do a soft pull, and this, this does not uh, give that same response to the spam calls so that we have time to have them fill out that opt-out email uh, before we do the hard pull, because that's, that's what happened. Uh, he pulled your credit on hard, and all, all the spammers saw that information. That was a great question and a great answer. Um, so out of like 10 or 15 loans that I've done with Edge Home Finance, there's only been one time that that's, ha that's happened. So it's definitely a hit or miss type thing, Josh. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely a good thing to keep in mind to uh, do that opt out thing and advise that to your clients every time. Um, because that one time that it happened, the guy was like, I don't trust this, this lender. I got I want to work with somebody else. I feel like he sold my information, but it was nothing that that lender did, nothing that broker did. It was just that it just happened to be the person that started getting spammed with every every 10 minutes. So right. definitely and, and Zora, I can um I'll send you our opt out uh link that we send to our consumers to send to you guys that you can send out to your consumers. It's not like tied to Edge Home Finance, the general opt out uh URL. Awesome. Thank you. What other questions we have? Also keep in mind Chase is uh a real real estate investor aside from his uh mortgage broker gig so if you have any questions on that piece definitely send them uh he was telling me about the uh that bigger pockets conference that he's going to at the end of this month um over on maui so if you're looking for a little networking event definitely look into that what other questions we got you drop it in the chat unmute yourself Cool. Hey, Chase, I have a quick question. Yeah. Uh, so why did you, this is just, I guess, on the investor side, why did you choose to do a syndication for that 12 units instead of uh, um, just, you know, getting a mortgage on it and, and buying it yourself? Like, was there yeah, a, a benefit besides like, um, like any money concerns? Like, was there a benefit to doing the syndication? Right. Yeah. Great question. Um, first off, um, cause I'll answer your original question, but I was a limited partner. So with a syndication, you have the general partners who are the people who found the deal and are, are presenting the deal and they get investors who, who are the limited partners. So on that deal, I, it was just a buddy had found a property, uh, in Virginia beach and offered it to friends that he knew were in real estate as limited partners. So I was just an investor in his deal. Um, so I didn't have any say on that. So, um, but the reason why you would syndicate over, uh, not just buy the deal outright is uh, financing is huge. So once you get past four units, you can't get a conventional loan. So conventional loans, uh, Fannie and Freddie May loans, and in the, in the even in the VA loan too. So Ginny May, 
they could, they only finance up to four units. Once you get past four units, now you're in what's called the non QM space, non qualified mortgage space. So it's not, they don't, they are not uh, refined to the same stipulations as Fannie, Freddie, uh, and the VA loan stipulations. And what that means is, since it's like a riskier loan, since it's not uh, non QM, the, the lending standards are more stringent. You're having, you're going to have higher interest rates, commonly two, 3% higher than your typical conventional owner occupied home, uh, and a lot more down payment requirement. There's no 0% down payments for 12 unit buildings. You, you're going to be putting down at least 35, 40%. Uh, to get that financing. So just by the nature of the financing needed, uh, there's it's unless you have millions of dollars kind of stashed away, uh, you're not buying these things all cash and all out. You need investors. Uh, <clears throat> you need two investors, really. You need a, a, a bank, you need a financing partner, and then you need, like I said, limited partners for cash because you need to, not only do you need to get a loan from a bank for the, the majority for like the 70% of the loan uh, up for to purchase the property, that 30% down payment uh, on a multi-million dollar structure is still huge too. So you need to kind of finance that through private investors through cash. And that's what I did as a limited partner. I was providing cash for my friend's down payment and he went to a bank. So that's why when you get, when you get into these multifamily homes, you, you typically need financing. Uh, and that's why uh, you can't buy it outright like that. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. And just uh, one more quick question. Do you guys offer, uh, you said non-qualifying uh, mortgages? Do you guys offer those? Yeah. yeah. So that's another awesome thing about uh, the broker. We have uh, the broker space. We just have so many product, more products available to us. And I was super, super stoked as a real estate investor uh, myself to find out all these products and I can't uh, stop like learning about them. But um, the DSCR program, uh, you may, uh, if anybody here is familiar with real estate investing, you may be familiar with that. DSCR is debt service coverage ratio loan. So these are investor loans uh, and it's only based on the property. Uh, it doesn't look at a consumer's personal DTI. They will pull the credit score to make sure they're credit worthy, but the lender is making the loan based on the performance of the property, not the consumer's income or his W-2 job. So not only is it a super uh, easy and quick closing process because they're just looking at the, the, uh, the property and the financials, uh, but consumers who have a higher DTI since they maybe bought a primary home already or they have... Uh, kind of a lot of consumer debt, uh, as long as their credit scores within the, the threshold, it, it doesn't matter how much they're making, it matters what the property is cash flowing. And so the way the DCR in short works is they take your monthly payment, what would be on that loan, uh, and divide it by the, the monthly rent that they could get. And that gives you a, a number. And the higher that number, the, the better your loan term. So I, I personally have DSCR loans on my investment properties. So that's just one example. We have bank statement loans, which is big for self-employed people who can't uh, can't show W-2s. They only have tax returns because they're business income. So we have bank statement loans. We even have commercial loans for commercial real estate, uh, which is crazy. And uh, SBA loans, small business loans. So it's just, it's really kind of crazy the, the amount of, of options that mortgage brokers have. Uh, and that's not to say that every mortgage broker is going to want to do that. It kind of, you know, people sometimes don't want to branch out. Me as an investor, I'm super stoked about the investment loans. So I, I tell people, bring your investment loans, whereas some um, mortgage brokers, they might be comfortable with doing VA loans for primary buyers and they don't want to touch that. So although they have it available to them. Thank you, Chase. Thank you. All right, so we're a little over 30 minutes past the hour. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. We'll stick around a little longer for the people that don't want to ask questions in front of the masses. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end the recording. Oh, yes.